December 17th, 2007, just before six o'clock in the morning, I was assigned to engine five. We were dispatched to report a fire in a building. As we arrived on scene as part of the second alarm assignment, there was heavy fire venting out of the front of the building. We were assigned to lead lines up to the second floor. We were working for about 15 minutes. And the last thing I remember was my chin strap being in front of my face and someone shouting, we have a man down, man down. I'm not supposed to be here. Sirens blaring on the way to the trauma center. It was then that he informed me that a large section of the ceiling had fallen 30 feet, hitting me on the head. And it was 9.30 or 10 o'clock in the morning, getting a ride back to the firehouse from the hospital that I finally had a chance to talk to my wife. She'd asked, was I at that big fire that was on the news? And I told her, not anymore. That's the day I almost died. As part of my continuing recovery, after returning to work after three weeks, it was suggested that I start a journal to share my ideas. I chose blogging instead as a way to share my story and as a way of cheap therapy. And while I was sharing these stories, it made me even more appreciative of how lucky I was since some of my coworkers have been injured far more severely than myself. It was through blogging and learning about the new social media that I found that there's an entire community online of paramedics and firefighters like myself sharing their own stories. It was in that community that I met Mark Lenkhorst, paramedic with the Northeast Ambulance Service. Reading Mark's post and about his patients and calls and how similar they were to mine, but how completely different his system handled them made me want to learn more. So we're here at the uh, International Arrivals Gate here at uh, San Francisco International Airport, anxiously awaiting Mark's arrival. Uh, I've got the helmet so he can spot us. Right now I'm getting text messages from uh, CK EMTP who's asking me if I have Mark with me yet. It's been nine months in the making since we started uh, chatting with each other about finally meeting in person, talk about EMS, and uh, really looking forward to it. I'll check the new twits, tweets from my tweeples, whatever it's called, and then I've got new messages on Facebook already. Uh, by the way, Chronicles. So a lot of people are asking how we've got to this point, experiencing this exchange of ideas across the Atlantic. And for the, for the answer to that, we only have to look back over the last 10 months when I started a, a blog on the internet about my experiences as a paramedic in the northeast of England. Through that, I started reading other people's blogs and I stumbled at a very early stage across the happymedic.com. And out of the blue, I just thought I would approach this guy, whoever he is, wherever he is, I didn't know where he worked, and ask about the possibility of coming over to work with him. Found out he worked in San Francisco, which made it even more exciting for me. So we developed this relationship where the project was born. We're here in San Francisco on the edge of the Financial District in the Barbary Coast neighborhood and I've brought UK paramedic Mark Glencourse to show him a little bit of history of the San Francisco Fire Department and this great city. You'll notice where we are, uh, downhill here is very flat as opposed to the rest of the city. This used to be the waterfront. Right. And after the Great Fire they took all that rubble of everything that fell and they pushed it into the water and the city actually grew at that time. And right behind us is the first firehouse that was rebuilt after the Great Fire in 06. It's the house of Engine Company Number 1. And it's one of the hidden gems here in the city that just walking down the street, you'd never even see it. Yeah. It's also uh, rumored that back in 1866, when the volunteer companies were rolled into the municipal fire service, that this was the place where the first paid firemen west of the Mississippi responded from. So it's, it's just a fantastic piece of history here uh -huh. in San Francisco. And it's one of the main reasons that I chose to work here. Leaving old station one. I set out to give Mark an understanding of the history, culture of the community he was going to be visiting for the week. While we walked, another community was growing, following our updates and comments using social media. A friend of mine at AMR said he'd become a fan of Chronicles of EMS. And I thought, oh, you know, not another of these sites. You know, let me check them out. And then I thought, oh, this looks kind of interesting. And without warning, our audience, who was keeping tabs on us on Twitter and Facebook, decided to become more than an observer, but an active participant in the Chronicles of EMS. And he wasn't the only one. Good morning, How are you? Good morning, Chief. Just to see you. Mark Hello. Glenn Horst. Nice to meet you, Joanne Hayes. Welcome. Please, thank you. Hey, Justin, how are you? Good morning. You know, I applaud the two of you for like I said, getting connected and taking the initiative to you to take an interest in seeing how we our procedures work here, and then Justin for you to you know both take time away from your families in the interest of getting a better understanding of just co collectively the, the the careers you've chosen and how that works 
the UK and in, in the United States. So both my hats off to both yeah. of you too. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome to our city. Nice spending some time with you. Thanks again, Justin. We're very proud of you. Our next stop was Twitter headquarters, where we hope to share with them how their service was enhancing communication between EMS professionals and the sharing of best practices. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Dan. So So your first call, fire-based EMS, chest pain at a payphone. Yeah. And you saw as we were arriving, the, the fire engine had already arrived on scene. They had it sitting on the tailboard there. We made contact, saw it wasn't exactly a, a necessarily life-threatening situation. We got him in the back, did a little, little better look at him. On a scale of one to 10, if one was just a pinch and 10 was the worst pain you've ever felt in your whole life, how bad is it now? One by over. A thousand? One so this is, this is the worst pain you've ever felt in your whole life? And can you describe it to me? What kind of pain is it? Sharp. Sharp? So how often do you get this discomfort in your chest? Anytime it wants to. Anytime it wants to? You want to go up to the general today and get checked out? Yes. All right, we'll get you on the way. I'm going to give you a little bit of aspirin. I can't take aspirin. Can't take aspirin. All right. As soon as you're set, uh, nice easy put to the general. There's no difference to, mm -hmm. to what we do. Other than, like I've said, we would have stayed on scene and rather than moving to, to do some of the things because he, even though he was, he was saying a lot of magic words, mm -hmm. you, you sort of knew. And that's what tips us off on some of these assessments and it's great to see that you get the same thing as when I ask what is your pain scale and he says 11 out of 10 yeah. without skipping a beat, without taking a breath, no sign of distress on his face. It really leads down that line of is this really a cardiac event or not? Yeah. And being, being familiar with, with him and his presentation as our EMT was and as you saw in the hospital. Yeah, everybody knows Everybody him. knew who he was. Even the attending physician came by and said hello to him. He's been here so many times. Yeah. But there's just really no place in the system for him. So when he needs his care, he'll call up 911. He knows the buzzwords to say. Chest pain, pounding, radiating. UK or US, at you the know. end of the day, what I tell my lot and stuff is, it's, it's your job. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, you might not believe a true clinical presentation, but you have to tick your boxes as well. Exactly, and um, since you're going to be here another four or five days, chances are we might even get to see him again. Let's go and do the next yep. one. All right. Yes, yep. I Okay. Soy Justin, un paramédico, un poco español. He's got a laceration on his forearm. I keep our forward. Hold that. Ready? All right. Y, y no más, no más. No duele su cabeza. Abren, abren sus hojas. Y su boca. No? How did this happen? Accidente? Yeah. Well. Nice deep breath. Hold nice and still for me. Little poke on three. One, three. Congratulations. That was my first perfectly holding still IV Thank you so much. in 10 plus years. I'll tell you what, let's hold the let's hold on the fanfare until I got it all set up and taped down here, okay? It's pretty similar to uh, what you see, Mark. In what respect? Basic, straightforward, mild trauma care. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Ban bandage yes. up and be along? Yeah, pretty much. All right. So this came in as a shortness of breath with bleeding, probably because of the language barrier. Yeah, the inability to understand. Do you, do you have that in your area? Any, no. any cultural groups that give you well, we, we have a huge, difficulties? Well, as you know, we have a huge Orthodox Jewish population. Yes. But they've got the Hatzola to look after them and then pass yeah. on to us. Okay. But they're all mostly English speaking anyway. So, solamente paramedico y bombero. No, no, no. No, no, no. It's my job. Thank you. Well, So Mark, for breakfast, a little um, bagel. They've got scones and such here at the Pete's for you. Just because I'm British doesn't mean I eat scones. Or tea. <laughs> tea. So are you, are you going to be okay today working the ambulance with no meal breaks or no, with nothing definitive uh, time off, just kind of get it when we do. can? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's weird. You know, that, well, that wouldn't, that's not going to happen when you come over to us. You know, it'll be, by the time it gets five hours into the shift, you'll be saying, right, we need to stand down now, we need to go back to the station. Oh. But, uh, it'll be good. Control Medic 99 responding. Can you confirm code two, code three? 20 minutes on scene. 
Yeah, we'll do, we'll do our requisite 25 minutes and see where we are. Another call we had, the uh, motor vehicle versus pedestrian. Yeah. Uh, I think that was the really first chance you had to see the, the engine company arrive on scene first yeah. and, uh, and start working. Um, what were your impressions of the way things were handled before we arrived? Um, it's probably the same. There's a lot of time for, for motor vehicle accidents. If it's a significant accident, the fire brigade will respond as well. The main thing that I noticed, and that's probably different slightly from us, is that everything was very, very quick. Um, you know what? I don't, I don't see any gross trauma. She's alert. I think I'll just stick with me. We've got your bag and everything. We've got everything on. I, think, I don't know what our unseen time was. I mean, she wasn't critically injured. There wasn't a lot to do other than try and calm her. Okay. Oh, the bugs I, I know. I'm gonna go down and take a better look at you. Like here, just so. Nice deep breaths. Okay. You're gonna be just fine. Here, hold my hand. Hold my hand. Slow down your breathing. Trust me. You're gonna feel better. Okay. It's always going to help to have more hands on scene. You know, I think in our industry, at least in the U.S., it's it's really ingrained in our young paramedics that the golden hour in trauma injuries, from getting the person from the time of injury into definitive care, needs to be less than one hour. And here in the city center, uh, that was probably the longest transport to the trauma center we'll, we'll ever have to deal with, and it was 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that was in the back of my mind as it's coming up on commute time. We're at least 20, 25 minutes from the hospital, and if, if anything starts to happen, we're gonna be delayed. Yeah. So when we saw no, no gross injuries, nothing that needed to be treated at the scene, you know, I made the decision then to get her up and be able to properly assess the injuries in the ambulance. But, but I'm glad you're able to see the, the engine arriving on scene and how extra hands can make like that. Yeah. Interesting patient where uh, kind of our two systems uh, treated differently. Are you having any chest pain? Yeah. Go poke on your finger. Yeah, I know. I told you. I don't have that. Well, Val, because of the way that that you're talking and you're tired, I have to confirm that it's just your history and not something new since the last time the paramedics checked you out two and a half hours ago. Do you find that, that your patients also try to go to sleep on you, like she did? Yeah, sometimes. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, you can't sleep. I need you to stay awake. People that present the same as her, where the, the initial complaint gets the quick response, yeah. and then it starts to bounce around, and yeah. I can see that what they're really looking for is just a few hours of refuge from the streets. Yeah. So if I can keep her awake and talking to me and trying to get more history out of her, then maybe next time she'll think, well, you know, it's not a place to sleep, and if that's all I want, maybe I'll seek that out somewhere else. Yeah. St. Francis, ER, good evening. This is medic van number 99, code 2, ETA about 5 to 7. Oh, On board, I have a 52-year-old female. Oh, she is conscious, alert, disoriented, consistent with uh, copious ETOH ingestion. Blood sugar comes back normal. Unless you have any questions, we'll see you in about 5 to 7. St. Luke's, St. Luke's is all the way across town. We're, if you need a doctor, i got to get you to a doctor. No, St. Francis. Oh no. Hey Val. Hey Val. Do they know yet, St. Francis? No. They don't like me. They don't like you. Why wouldn't they like you? My doctor said St. Luke. You told me St. Francis. I said St. Luke. I said St. Francis or General, and you no, said St. Francis. I said St. Luke. Well, we're already here. Let's get inside and see the doctors, and if everything's fine, then everything's fine. I, I can say that we didn't want to take her yeah. against her will, but our, our hands were tied. And it turns out that even though we took that resource and took that person to the hospital, the hospital immediately triaged her to the waiting room. Yeah. So she really just moved the location. And it, it seems like you have more of that flexibility to use your own uh, clinical, clinical skills and yeah. your clinical judgment. Because you all think the exact same way that I do. You'll go out to someone and you'll see there's no need for them to go to the hospital, but you just can't say that. Or you can't refer them on to an alternate provider where we can, you know. I can't see how that will ever change. There's this automatic right that your patients seem to have that if they want to go to hospital, they are going to go to hospital full stop.
one of the first things you saw was the first person to say, how much will this cost me? How am I going to afford this? Yeah. And it was very interesting to see the look on your face. My name is hey. Justin. Hey. I'd like to get you in the back of the ambulance, do a proper workup on you. Okay. And this foot? Yeah, all swollen up there, huh, buddy? One, two, three, there you are. There has to be something wrong. Well, not necessarily. There may just be something that's not quite right. Two completely different things, right? Uh, I, may, I have never been to a hospital. And right now, I'm, Here, I'll trade you I'm scared to death. You're scared to death. Well, you're, yeah, still, you're I, still breathing, so it's not working. Because it's a new experience for me. It's a totally new experience. Yeah. Now, how long have your legs been swollen like this? I, I didn't even know they were swollen. Yeah. I think that might be contributing a little bit to how you're feeling. Yeah, I'm not accustomed to this type of intense attention. Well, I, I think from time to time, you're 83, you need some of this type of attention. I think we need to, I think we need to figure out why your legs are swollen and your blood pressure is a little high. I've been there 20 years. Uh-huh. I used to live right up here on 15th. I used to walk past there all the time. Yeah. I gave up my apartment because business got tight. Mm -hmm. you know, just, okay, so business got tight. You moved into the uh, into the yeah, shop. I threw a pot in the back. Yeah. I got to We'll worry about who's paying when you feel better. Fair enough. Well, I don't feel bad. Well, tell you what. How about we worry about paying for it when we find out why your blood pressure is high and why your legs are swollen. Okay. We'll make sure you're healthy. We'll prove you right. Then we'll worry about money down the line. When, you, when you're trying to sort of console them, but they're saying, you know, don't worry about the bills, just let's sort you and then worry about the bills later. Do you know, That's, is, it, is that just to get him to the hospital or because yeah, it, it, he does have to worry about them later? To try, to get, his, going to, to try to get his mind off of it, if, I, if I'm realistic with him and tell him that, you know, this plus the emergency room is going to cost him tens of thousands of dollars most likely, he might be hesitant to call us next time. And how does that make you feel that you have to do that? That's that, the system. I would love to not have to have that conversation with my patient. And you'll see while you're here, it comes up a lot. Yeah. And unfortunately, with someone who, who's in the state that he's in, you know, he, he can't stay home. He's not going to get better. Yeah, so let's say they work him up cardiac and they keep him for a couple days. Mm -hmm. And if it was the landlord that they technically evict him and start cleaning out his place, now when he gets out of the hospital, he's got no place to live. Wrong. That's going to be my blog title tonight. <laughs>